Hello everyone, my name is Khadija Shfi and I'm a PhD student in Hassan First University of Morocco. Today I'm going to share a subset of my research with you. Well, I will start by introducing uh, the research, describing materials and methods, results and discussion and a conclusion. Well, human genetic populations uh, is the study of genetic variation within and between population and evolutionary factors that explain that variation. This variability is the result of the history of populations, which is recorded in DNA sequences, and its correct interpretation allows us to define the population's structure and in somehow study their uh, genetic diversity and its variation in space and time. Well, DNA represent different types of variation like SNPs, uh, short tandem repeats, and allopermorphism. In this study, the markers of interest are autosomal short tandem repeats. They are high, they represent high mutation rates, which uh, help to analyze human genetic variation, recent gene flow, and differentiation between individuals. These markers are actually variously uh, widely used in evolutionary genetics, population genetics, and forensics. Well, the main area uh, of interest in this city is North Africa. Why? This region is very interesting in a human population genetic perspective, since it consists of four different uh, genetic ancestry, including Stockton's North African and Middle Eastern, Sub-Saharan African European ancestries. Well, the population precisely in interest in this uh, study is called Shewia. It's an Arabic-speaking population located in Morocco, in the Western Center, precisely. This name applies also uh, to another population in North Africa called Shewia, uh, which is located in Algeria. The current study is the first genetic identification of the general population of Shewia based on 15 autosomal short tandem repeats of the Amplifiester and Dichfiler kit. This study aims to the utility of these STR in anthropological studies on this population, as well as investigate the genetic affinities between Shewia and other North African populations. Well, uh, buccal swabs were collected from 150 randomly selected and related healthy individuals of both genders from Shewia population with ancestry traced back at least three generations. Uh, DNA was extracted using Collex 100 method and nano drop. 8,000 spectrophotometer was used for DNA quantification. For PTA, PTR amplification of the 15 STRs, uh, it was performed using the 2720 thermal cycler. For each sample tested, one nanogram of DNA was amplified in a final reaction of 25 microliters. The amplified pro product was separated and detected using IBI 3500 genetic analyzer and genotyping was performed by comparison with other clutter including uh, included uh, in the kit using gene marker IDX software. Well, uh, statistical parameter of the 15 STR was uh, analyzed using uh, two different softwares. Um, Phylogeny was assessed throughout the neighbor joining method based on knee genetic distance using pop tree web software. Locus by locus AMOVA test was used to estimate the existence of a source of variation among groups using the Alican software version 3.5. Well, here uh, this table presents uh, the different characteristics of uh, the 15 SCR Lucy in Shewia population. Uh, the highest heterozygosity was observed in the marker D18. Uh, two markers represented a deviation of hardy Umberg equilibrium, including TH001 and D18. Uh, well, all markers exhibited high power dis discrimination, but the highest was exhibited by D18. Uh, the highest power of exclusion and the typical paternity exists. Uh, index was exhibited by marker D19, which uh, conclude that it is, it is the marker, the most popular marker for paternity testing. Well, the combined power of discrimination and exclusion for the 15 uh, SCROC was uh, relatively high, uh, which uh, these results testified the utility of this marker for forensic purposes. 
The show population after a Bonferroni correction, two of the 15 markers deviated from hardy one equilibrium could be attributed to two different reasons. First, non-random mating. It's been reported, it has been reported that consumless marriage accounted for 25.38% of marriages in Sharia population. And also the molecular definition of these markers could be a problem too. Due to fluctuation in mutation rates and possible genetic drift, the allelic distribution in some loci might change causing the disequilibrium. Okay, here we have uh, the neighbor joining tree, uh, the phylogenetic tree based on the genetic distance. We observe that the Arabic speaking population of Shewia we have we are interested on is relatively close to the, the Berber population of uh, Azru, located in uh, Morocco. Here, if you could take a look back to the historical perspective, the population of Shewia could be described as a mixture of heterogeneous Berber elements, strongly Arabized and crossed with a small proportion of Iranian Arab blood, which is a description to be commonly used to the majority of North African population. Here, the anthropology of North Africa mainly is a cute of two major ethnic groups, the Berbers, the indigenous population, and the Arabs, whose expansion across North Africa marked 1,400 years ago, which uh, the Arabs has a great role in the Arabization of North Africa. So to verify if the impact of the Arab expansion in North Africa had a significant impact on their genetic pool, we divided North African population into two groups based on the linguistic criteria, Berber speaking populations and Arabic speaking populations. So the locus by locus AMOVA results exhibits no significant genetic vary differentiation was observed between the two groups, which might lead us to conclude that the impact of the Arabization following the Arab expansion, expansion was cultural rather than, dem than demographic. In fact, previous studies have reached the results confirming that linguistic differences are only a cultural phenomenon rather than a genetic replacement. Needless to, needless to say, if we take a look back to the phylogenetic tree, we could say, see that uh, uh, North African population were divided to, according to geographic criteria, to a Northwestern African group and a Northeastern African group. If we take the test of locus by locus AMOVA, we could see that uh, ge significant genetic differences were observed in port markers. This could be explained by uh, referring to a study uh, uh, of genetic variation pattern in North Africa using single nucleotide for polymorphism, that there are two opposing ancestry gradients were observed. An increase in, in autochthonous Maghribi African ancestry, the Berbers from east to west, uh, explaining from Egypt to Morocco, and an increase in Near Eastern Arabic ancestry from from east to west, from Egypt to Morocco, which rather explained that the contribution of Berbers and Arab into the genetic pool may vary throughout the landscape of North Africa. Conclu uh, to conclude, uh, this study of these autosomal STR variation in the Arabic speaking population of Shewia revealed that our study population was the nearest to the Berber speaking population of Azro was clustered with Northwestern African group, which means that the contribution of the Berber ancestry was higher than the Arabic one. These results seem actually to be concordance with the historical perspective describing Shoya people as a mixture of heterogeneous Berber elements strongly Arabized and crossed with a small proportion of Iranian Arab blood. Overall, the genetic landscape of a given population is a combination of many factors, such as historical event, geographical distance, cultural and religious background, which participate in increasing or minimizing genetic distances between populations. And thank you for your uh, attention. This is me. Thank you for your wonderful presentation, Khadija. Uh, so, we can take up the questions offline. Uh, so request you to share your email address in the university you belong to in the chat box okay. and your area of interest so that we can get in touch. And also nice that you have done a demographic study 
and demography to demography, there will be changes. <coughs> Thank you. I will be very fast because I was pretty sure that the conference will be physically, so I got a poster, not the presentation, but I will try to describe you everything that I have here <clears throat> at the poster. So my name is Agmara Sota, and I am a PhD student at the Krakow University of Technology. And today I would like to present the results obtained as a part of my PhD thesis on biomaterial coatings for bone tissue regeneration. Uh, and the topic of the presentation um, today is uh, evaluation of hybrid coating material as uh, drug carriers. Uh, so yeah, uh, using biocompatible polymers uh, and ceramics, um, polymers such as polyvinyl pyrolidon and polyethylene glycol, ceramics like hydroxyphatate, uh, I developed a composition of uh, composite coatings, uh, which I then applied to polylactic plates. Uh, here you can see the... Um, picture of my coatings, and I add uh, hydroxyapatate uh, in the content of 5 and 15 percent. Uh, and I measure the effect of the ceramic and uh, collagen additives on the sorption capacity <clears throat> and on the hardness of the coatings. Uh, here for the hardness measurement, uh, I uh, find out that influence of hydroxyapatate on the hardness uh, can be seen as the value clearly increase uh, with an increase uh, in the contribution of hydroxyapatate in the material. Uh, here on the right side, um, uh, I uh, present you the sorption capacity. Uh, and the highest sorption capacity was observed for the polymeric materials. Uh, so uh, the one without the ceramic phase. Uh, and that's because the ceramic grains kind of occupy the free spaces between the polymer chains um, Hence, this parameter decreases as the amount of uh, ceramics increase. Uh, however, even a low swelling capacity of the material is a kind of satisfactory parameter uh, because it suggests that such material can be uh, later used as a drug carrier. Uh, the most important uh, thing, I guess, uh, it's at the end of my poster uh, over here, <clears throat> and that's the fact that um, the results present uh, on this poster today. Uh, were obtained uh, with it within the framework of the project, uh, multifunctionally biologically active composites for application in uh, regenerative bone system medicine. Uh, and that's all from my side for today. Uh, I will uh, write you um, my email on the chat. So if you get any questions, you can uh, ask me. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Short. Gender diversity in the context of intersectionality theory. And my name is Diana Psyche, and this is with Dr. Elisa Anamitis. Elisa, um, so we. Yes, I'm here. I'm waiting are you to going, you share the screen. Can you see it? Presenting the first slides, like we said. Okay. Can everybody see the slides? Yes, yes, uh, we can see the slide. Please go ahead. Okay, so recently in the United States, in particular, and other re uh, Western countries, um, where gender has been traditionally defined as male or female, I don't see the screen, there have Diana. been there have been. Um, does everybody else see it? Do you please want me to start? Please go ahead. We can see the screen. Please go ahead. Okay, so now gender yes, categories have been. Um, emerged and the New York City Commission of Human Rights has defined 31 genders. Okay, people can see the screen, Elisa. Um, intersexuality theory suggests that individuals have several identities that intersect, such as gender and ethnicity. And there's been a lot of research that suggests that ethnicity and age intersect. And the theory could be useful in seeking additional insights about dress in particular and gender identity among the LGBTQIA plus population. Um, there's been limited research on this. So the purpose of this paper was to examine how different identities are expressed by LGBTQIA individuals residing in the United States. 
Um, we did a, some literature review. Um, there's two theories that relate. One is self-verification theory. Um, and it asserts that meanings are attached to objects and interaction with others determines meaning. And apparel scholars commonly use the term dress to identify components of appearance. Body supplements include additions to the body, such as clothing, and then modifications or changes to the body. And we did some previous research that suggests that dress is used among this population to seek verification from others. Um, intersexuality theory acknowledges individuals possess a combination of social and political identities within an unequal system. That's where it emerged from. And so there's been future research on it since um, the 1980s. And these theories have specifically identified gender and race as important intersecting identities. Um, they've also discussed sexuality and social um, and political level. And gender has been examined in relationship to other identities, including age and sexuality. And after review of literature on intersexuality theory, Brown and Mirza added that Social class intersects with race and gender. Intersexuality theory suggests that individuals' perspective is based on all of their sort of identities. However, some research argues that social identities become less influential based on specific context. And um, then there's also the discussion of stereotyping as well. And um, in regards to dress is expressed um, many identities and the concept of it is sort of limited in terms of research. And intersexuality theory was used to guide a context analysis of some related to dress. For example, women of color were depicted in textbooks in one study and they were linked um, to having thin bodies and light skin. Um, there's also been some intertwining um, relationships between dress and identity and religion, such as the Muslim um, women related to the hijab. Um, and Henley and Bentley interviewed co-ed youth soccer, and they found that it was an important part of identity intersecting with girls' concept of femininity and athleticism. And there's been limited studies specific to the LGBTQ IA plus um, individuals. However, there has been studies on um, homosexuality and um, this populations. Um, there's also been um, some work with regards to queer women in the U.S. Um, and masculine appearances. And then another body of research um, has focused on transgender individuals in the United States. And Ready Best examined um, LGBTQI plus individuals in the work environment. It most suggests that dress is related to identity. And limited research has been examined on non binary populations. And so the purpose of the study was to examine the expression of identities in addition to um, gender on non LGBTQI individuals. And we had three research questions. Um, and we used um, sort of a convenience um, sample, and it was a qualitative research study. We interviewed people for about 30 minutes, and then we used a qualitative analysis to analyze the results for themes. We had seven participants, one from urban and one from rural areas, and the age ranged from 24 to 49 years. And we had a range of um, sort of ethnic identities and they were mostly middle class. With regards to research, research question one, what identities are expressed with dress by the LGBTQ plus participants? Um, they discuss several identities and including with their gender and they describe it as onions. Like their identity was like layers of onions with several of them, including age, religion, personality, social group, geographic location, religion, sexual orientation, financial status, all expressed sort of at an interchange. 
Um, participants mentioned religious expression with trust, but they did um, not discuss it related to their own experience. And then age was discussed as well, as well as ethnicity and geographic location, whether they were rural or urban areas. Um, the second research question, how are identities expressed among LGBTQIA individuals with regards to dress? And there were some variations within it, given whether or not they were use body supplements or modifications. For example, body modifications were discussed related to profession. And there's an example quote right there. And then they also expressed personality or social group using both body supplements and modifications. And they um, participants also used body modifications to exhibit financial status, particularly in urban regions. And jewelry was discussed as a marker for sexual orientation. And finally, a participant discussed expressing gender and religion by stretching um, their earlobes. Um, to what extent, research question three, is dress important to the communication of other identities when compared to gender? Several themes are merged in the relationship and the three are listed there, combining expression of gender with other identities, expression of identity varied by context, stereotyping, appearance, cues, and fluid. Gender was expressed very fluidly. And these are some examples of this particular research question. There was also an issue of stereotyping that emerged during this particular um, research question. Um, so with regards to the final results indicated that many identities were expressed by these LGBTQIA plus participants. And this finding supports intersectionality theory and the notion that these other identities need to be considered to fully understand social exclusion of marginalized community. In addition to gender, participants discussed actively portraying the profession, personality, social group, religious group, social orientation, financial status through dress. And ethnicity, financial status, profession, and age identities were noted as additional identities that were misunderstood in discriminatory manner. And ethnicity, financial status, profession, and age identities were noted as additional identities that were misunderstood again as professional in a discriminatory manner. Um, personality appearance cues were also found to be misunderstood by um, others among the LGBTQ um, community. Um, participants tended to purposely enhance some of their these identities all the time. However, in support of self-verification theory, there is evidence that the emphasis of a participant identity through dress was temporarily temporary or fluid and it depended on the context as it changed through time. And this research has very practical application to human resource managers and teachers in post-secondary education. Um, and the research gives voice to multiple variables that to be considered among a marginalized group. And this research is limited to participants in the United States. So further research could be done in other countries, particularly those that are more accustomed to non-binary genders. Okay, there's our references. Thank you, Diana, for your wonderful presentation and uh, a great research work. Uh okay, my name is Malesh Ikawastra. <clears throat> I'm a uh, uh, this is a class of uh, Department of Physics, uh, Mangalore University, Mangalore University, under the guidance of uh, Professor Vai Narayana. Uh, my topic is Redan Education Rate in the Soil Temple of Dhamna District, Southern India. This is introduction. Uh, the Redan is a reactive and uh, chemical that gas uh, found in various environmental matters. Uh, uh, Obviously, recently, the radon emits the decay product uh, emits the alpha particles of energy nearly five mega uh, electron volts. The radon is odorless and invisible and without taste, and the radon cannot be detected in the human senses. 
uh, the retina is uh, to, 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 to is highly effectively in uh, damages, especially in the lung lung tissues. Uh, the retina is a three axis of uh, the name is uh, number one two twenty two retina is half life is three point eight four days and the retina two twenty is half life is fifty five second and uh, another one is two nineteen retina is half life is four second. The radium is one of the radioactive and element uh, found in soil, and the soil is one of the commonly used in uh, especially construction materials. The inhabitants of the region uh, spend about closely 80% of the time in the houses and offices. Consequently, uh, it is necessary to uh, determine the radiation hazards in the indoor environment. Uh, the rate at which uh, the radon escapes from one uh, soil into the surrounding around the atmospheric air uh, is known as the radon activation rate of the soil. And it is uh, measured either by per unit area uh, per unit area. Uh, in the present situation, uh, we have used in the LR one 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 type, uh, fifteen type of detector uh, to access the effect of radon on the people of Donegal region of Karnataka, India. Ah, uh, this is are using the instrumentation in the present uh, investigation. The plastic plate detector, uh, the LR115 type, uh, 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 maybe I think 3 into 3 centimeter size, was used in the present study to determine the run adjustment rate in this size sample. Uh, this is the detector. Uh, this is the spark counter. Uh, this is instrument used, uh, the, uh, the designed by the radiation tape system, a division of the uh, Baba Atomic Research Center. Uh, this instrument is consists of uh, two electrodes uh, between which the detector film is placed. Uh, so, uh, then the soap uh, sparking takes place through the whole of the myla film uh, produced by the alpha particles. If we are counting the uh, alpha particles, uh, we are placing the some uh, uh, the uh, before we are seeing the uh, plastic uh, the detector, the 3 into 3 centimeter. This should be placed in this uh, in a spark counter. Uh, this is the study area. The, we are collecting the samples in this area. That this is the, the occupation area, the 5926 uh, square kilometer, which is having uh, six talus, uh, namely in Kangiri, Wanali, Ariara, Arpanali, and Jagaluru. Uh, it is also Tunga Badra River, is also uh, close in the western part of Dangari, with uh, around 122 kilometers. The minerals are well concentrated in this region, such as maybe I think a manganese ore and the quad and white are you know, present in this area. The geological formation in Dhanga district is a place under major sedimentary components uh, called the inter belt of Dharva type. The district consists of mainly three types of soil uh, with the black, alluvial soil, red soil, with the shallow to medium depth, gravel, and clay soil. Materials and method. Uh, the seal can technique is the detector alone by was fixed on the top inside the cylindrical can. Uh, to avoid the track uh, contribution of the um, pore on India can. The LR115 kept approximately 10 cm distance between the sample uh, as part of the uh, photocop. Uh, the lower sensitivity part of the LR115 detector uh, freely is exposed to the emergent radon uh, from the samples in the steel can technique uh, so that it records the alpha particles tracks from the decay of radon in the can. This is the uh, structural formation of the steel can technique. I was showing the LR15 detector, the LR15 gas will be exposed to uh, lower to upper. Uh, this is the second, uh, this is the heating process. The how is the, the uh, second process will be heat. The alpha particles that from the 115 film are latent and not visible. And the film are uh, heat to, to enlarge the tracks and uh, make it visible. The LR15 film is where uh, heat is in a 2.5 N NOH solution. The temperature was maintained um, uh, uh, um, at 60 degrees centigrade. Uh, the heating rate was uh, 4 micrometers per hour. The thickness of the alarm film is uh, 12 micrometers per meter. Uh, in uh, duration of 1 hour, uh, the thickness was equal. Uh, the traction film is where pre counted as 900 degrees volts. Uh, the tax per centimeter square was determined that. 480 volts will be fixed, which is less than the uh, platinum reason. The result and discussion. The radon activity in soil, the radon activity in soil is varied from 45.61, uh, 0.8 per uh, magnitude, but to 136.4 uh, 
ಕೆಜಿ The open mass and surface circulation distance from one place to another place are due to the presence of radium and uranium concentration. The annual effect is those of the alpha, alpha index and emission coefficient. The effective of those are captured by the people uh, due to the radon is uh, progeny influenced by the level of the radon accumulation rate. The annual effect is those varies from uh, range from 1.1 to uh, 0.14. millis volt per year with a mean value will be 2.1 millis volt per year as suggested by the icrp uh, 1993 the mean annual effect goes uh, is within the suggested uh, action limit uh, 3 to 10 millis volt per year uh, in uh, some location of the study area the effect goes in the highly uh, higher than the normal background level of 1.15 uh, millis volt per year as suggested by the unsphere the alpha value of the found in the range of 0.8 to uh, 2.4 milli equal per kg with the mean value is 1.5 uh, milli equal per kg the alpha index value of the sample is lower than the suggested by the upper limit of 200 equal per kg the emission coefficient of radon in the range from 0.96% to 1.07% it mean value will found to be 1.0.1% in the study area of the uh, correlation the good positive correlation was observed between the surface circulation and the effective radium content in the soil sample uh, it may be observed that the radon accumulation rate uh, corresponds to the determine the value of the radium content uh, this will figure will show the uh, the significance of uh, positive correlation between the uh, surface circulation rate and the effective radium content uh, 0.99 now this is the comparison study of the other region of the world uh it will show the uh, is it india india and is it this is the radon accumulation rate in the uh, other region with the comparing with the uh, activity radon activity uh, values in the present study it is 39.60 uh, in the country of malaysia uh, in the present study the conclusion the radiological parameter such as radium concentration surface circulation rate and the mass degeneration rate were estimated using the lr 115 plastic tag detector by seal can technique to analyze the radiological risk due to the radon and the emitted from the soil the radon surface and mass degeneration rate was found to depend on the radium content of the soil a deep degeneration rate was a large uh, for sample uh, especially in some arapan valley for example in the present situation the study showed that the overall radon level in the soil are within the global average values the findings is indicate that the people of the region are Uh, protected from the impact of the radium on radon accumulation there is no radiological risk using this uh, soil of the region to make the um, bricks uh, which are used in the construction of the buildings this is uh, uh, really rapen and thank you thank you malishi for your wonderful presentation Hello everybody. I'm very sorry that cannot be with you personally. Today my poster presentation uh, will be uh, about the biomaterials and research carried out at Krakow University of Technology. Uh, I send via email uh, via uh, chat my uh, contact details after the uh, the presentation. Uh, maybe few a uh, few word about uh, research uh, um, realized in my lab in our lab we investigate bone and cartilage substitutes research concern study of new bioceramic 
technologies, development of new composite materials uh, such as polymer ceramic as well as metal uh, ceramic composites. Um, also physical chemical characterization and application possibilities and finally bioactivity assessment also in vitro and in vivo uh, test of biomaterials. Uh, some maybe some word about uh, bioceramic materials that we synthesize in our laboratories. We focused on hydroxyapatite properties um, and um, tricalcium uh, phosphate, but mainly uh, hydroxyapatite. Uh, the popularity of hydroxyapatite uh, ceramics is uh, uh, in the medical community is due to the properties of these materials. The most important of this is bioactivity, which ensures that tight connection between the uh, uh, between uh, calcium phosphate implants and the surrounding bone tissue. Uh, moreover, HAP uh, is characterized by the highest biocompatibility among known bi biomaterials, which is due to the chemical and mineralogical similarity to inorganic phases in present in bone and uh, as well as in teeth. Uh, in our work, we focus on composite materials. May mainly, we are looking for bone and cartilage substitutes because the fact um, that that bone is natural ceramic polymer composite. As you can see uh, on the, this uh, picture, we try to ma uh, make uh, the most um, biomimetic mim composition. Our goal is incorporate uh, hydroxyapatite particles into the polymers, a biodegradable matrix, uh, after uh, synthesis, we checked various physical chemical features. So we conduct bioactivity tests in simulated body fluids. We checked pH uh, level during the immersion, the rate of degradation, conductivity, and observed growth of the new layer apatites on the surface. Uh, and uh, um, I'm of this of the presented research uh, was create a ceramic polymer coatings demonstrating bioactive properties. Uh, for potential use in both tissue re regeneration. For this purpose, uh, hydroxyapatite um, known for its also inductive properties and polymer phase. The system was the modified uh, by addition of glutathione and, um, uh, and we tested mechanical properties as well as chemical properties and um, incubation um, result um, were carried out in fluids such, such, such as PBS or SBF. The pH value was measured and sorption capacity was determined to identify the potential use of uh, as a drug carrier. And this, uh, this um, research was support uh, financed by uh, Foundation for Polish Science and grant numbers below the uh, poster. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you for your wonderful presentation and very nice poster. Good um... afternoon to all the respected coordinators and participants. I am Varsha Paul and I'm going to present my research paper on the topic oil mining induced displacement and resettlement in Dikboy, Assam, India. So uh, here I go. Um, first, uh, the thing is, uh, oil and gas are significant players in, in not only the world's economy, but also India's economy as well. And as with the rise in demand for oil to meet the needs of the population is increasing, uh, India has been forced to import more than 86% of its oil requirement. So the country is trying to produce crude oil within the country as much as possible to cut on the import of oil supply. Uh, but uh, rise in demand has also put pressure on the companies to produce more. So uh, the thing is that um, as more and more uh, companies are encouraged to increase their production, so lands are being taken under control for large scale drilling purposes and it requires clearing an area of vegetation or human settlement as well. So people are forced to move out in the form of voluntary or involuntary displacements. Um, since like drilling of oil and pumping them sometimes require heavy oil leakages, it contaminates the surrounding areas, affecting the environment and livelihood of the local people and leaving them with no other option other than to resettle somewhere else. Um, 
so my objective of the study is to study the satisfaction level of compensation received by the displaced people and my area of study as mentioned in the topic itself is tick boy where uh, india's for one of the oldest operating refinery the tick boy refinery was commissioned in 1901 uh, in my literature review uh, out of all the literature reviews that i have studied for this paper i have taken into consideration these three literature reviews uh, as more important the first one uh, observes that the uh, as oil operations have started occurring pollution has made people to uh, leave their lands and go out and are forced to re uh, relocate economically uh, and also their uh, living standards have degraded another literature review have also argued that the uh, land which is acquired forcefully for these projects uh, the landowners get very less monetary compensation uh, compared to the monetary value of the land but another literature review have argued that the mining have provided uh, economic gain to the villagers in the same time it also have diversified the employment opportunities and business opportunities for the locals as well mm -hmm. so uh, my research methodology uses primary data and secondary data around the indian oil corporation limited in the 50 kilometer jurisdiction i have taken 50 households for this purpose of the study the results that I have found out that 15% of the sample household population lost their land holdings belong to 32 to 45 age group. And most of them belong to the scheduled caste, which is like uh, the people who need more benefits from the society as well. And uh, the 20% of the people who have lost their livelihoods because of the land acquisition or oil leakage are family people and married with kids living in a nuclear or joint family so uh, basically uh, uh, the people they are self employed and they have been working in their own lands and have been displaced due to oil leakage in their agricultural land and 10% uh, of these sample household who have lost their livelihoods earn less than 1 lakh annually mm -hmm. Also, uh, the second observation is, that is made is that the households which are paid by IOCL, Indian Oil Corporation Limited, as compensation, but uh, the people who have their own lands only got the compensation, but the people who are working in those lands and they don't own any land, they did not get any compensation and they have lost their livelihoods and got no benefits at all. Mm, the third observation that has been made is that the 25 percent of the sample population feels sufficient and content with the compensation but 42.5 population are neutral about it because they don't feel that the compensation has either benefited them or not benefited them if they are particularly neutral about it they are not really happy or unhappy either but 20 percent of the sample households were not satisfied with the amount the compensation amount that has been paid to them. So uh, my conclusion is that the maximum number of people who lost their land and livelihood altogether fall in the middle aged group. And it is also observed that the number of males who receive the compensation are more than the female counterparts in the middle age group who have received the uh, compensation. And it also includes those families who have lost their livelihoods and had a, fa had a family to feed to. But some of them got no compensation because they were merely working on others' lands and they do not have any other livelihood options as well. And the third conclusion is that uh, people were very neutral about the compensation because the uh, compensation was not enough for their resettlement in some other places. because. Uh, also, the percentage of dissatisfied people are also very large compared to the people who were satisfied with the compensation. 
uh, this thing also sometimes lead to protests and violent situations, especially in these mining areas, because people are forcefully dis uh, displaced and are forced to resettle somewhere else and start a new life. And the compensations offered to them is not enough to go back to their normal lives. Thank you. Uh, here I conclude my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful. Good day, everyone. I hope everyone is having a great day. Um, my name is Juniet, and I am a master's student at the University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. My study is based on a subsection of my master's, which is distinguishing between human induced land degradation from the effects of rainfall in the Greater Skokuna District Municipality. The study is conducted under the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research and a project called Securing Multiple Benefits. Uh, through sustainable land management and uh, in a degraded landscape. So uh, land degradation is one of the major global um, environmental uh, problems that affects the sustainability and livelihoods of approximately 1.5 billion people globally. And then, um, Land degradation is a complex environmental and socio-economic issue in arid and semi-arid regions, particularly due to its um, interdisciplinary nature that includes um, geographic, uh, social, and ecological aspects. And in semi-arid regions, climate variability and poor land use practices have intensively um, degraded um, the land such, such that more than 70% of uh, the land in South Africa is intensively degraded. So distinguishing between human-induced land degradation and climatic factors and also assessing the effects in um, arid lands is crucial to identify appropriate interventions, land management and restoration. However, there is still a um, depth of literature that distinguish uh, land degradation arising from anthropogenic and climatic um, drivers. There are also issues from various studies of land degradation on the lack of agreement on the existence and uh, location of land degradation. As a result, um, most studies often end in discussion about the degree or even the reality of um, land degradation. Uh, the results also are normally uh, dominated by regular um, rainfall patterns, related seasonal and drastic, drastic um, changes in land use and land covers, making land degradation uh, difficult to um, distinguish it. So, and then so uh, special monitoring systems um, can uh, really assist in terms of uh, distinguishing uh, different types of land degradation. So a residual trend method is a special um, method which reveals a uh, special patterns of factors driving land degradation at a cell level. The method is based on um, the condition that uh, water is the most limiting factor to vegetation productivity and there is a strong correlation between vegetation productivity and um, climatic variables in arid and semi-arid regions. So since uh, vegetation productivity in drylands uh, reaches its peak in years with a high amount of rainfall. It is therefore possible to remove effects of rainfall to understand human induced um, or to, under to understand human activities on the overall uh, vegetation um, condition. Therefore, uh, the objective of the study um, was to distinguish human induced land degradation from a uh, rainfall using a res rest trend or residual trend method from 1990 to 2019 in the Greater Skokuna District Municipality. The study area is located in a semi-arid environment with an annual average rainfall of 560 millimeters. The dominating geology of the area is ultramafic substrates, which has um, low nutrient availability, and the soils are susceptible to erosion. And the dominating land use in the area is agriculture, and uh, more than 70, or about 70% of um, the farmers are subsistence farmers who are engaged in livestock and crop farming. So high climatic uh, variability and change and climate extremes have altered the environment in the area, such that like it has uh, thre is, is threatening livelihoods of um, vulnerable rural communities. 
Then future agricultural concerns in the area include uh, water scarcity, land conflicts, inappropriate land use, poor infrastructure and services, and also uncontrolled um, grazing, all of this which um, threaten the, the environment and contribute to land degradation. So the um, uh, methodology of the study included a um, quantitative uh, method where we had to uh, use a residual trend method to uncover spatial patterns of uh, factors driving land degradation at a cell resolution. And we also used uh, ArcGIS, QGIS, and RStudio to assess the rainfall and NDVI trends at both spatial and temporal levels using average daily wet seasonal data. And then a uh, qualitative um, method, we had to use a semi-structured or key informant interviews to understand and um, reveal like some of these um, or reasons behind changes in land use and land covers of the area. In terms of uh, data collection, uh, we used NDVI. NDVI is a normalized difference vegetation index uh, from AVHRR sensors. And the, the NDVI is used as a land degradation proxy. And it's uh, strongly correlated with above ground net primary productivity. And then a rainfall was a thematic uh, factor that was used. And um, this is, uh, we had to collect a satellite derived uh, rainfall data. And um, also like informant interviews or semi-structured interviews. And then for data analysis, uh, we had to use a residual trend method of um, NDVI time series, which was calculated by determining the difference between observed NDVI and uh, rainfall predicted NDVI. The restaurant uh, analysis was done firstly by carrying out, it, it involves three method, three um, steps. So the firstly, we had to do a pixel-wise ordinary least square regression model or regression linear model of a NDVI against rainfall. Then secondly, um, analysis of a residual um, NDVI that is not explained by rainfall. And uh, finally, we had to do another uh, or less regression, which was a regression of the residuals against time. And then these are uh, represented like the residual trend. And the residual trend model reveals a human induced land degradation that might be detected if significant effects of um, rainfall uh, factors are removed. And then uh, with this, um, if uh, the residual trend is a uh, significant, um, if we analyze the trend, if the trend is significant, then it means that a uh, land degradation is due to um, human impact. And then if the trend is not significant, then it means that land degradation is due to uh, climatic effect, um, rainfall. So uh, from the results, um, we have like we had like two results so the temporal uh, residual trend and a spatial one so firstly i'll go through the temporal um, residual trend which shows that uh, the negative residual trend r value of a uh, negative 0 0.021 that had a sand slope um, um, of like negative 0 0.018 because we used a uh, man candle to test the trend or the significance and uh, magnitude of the trend so on the left um, is the, the uh, temporal um, residual trend, and then it shows uh, that the vegetation or the vegetation of the area is degrading, and the p value of uh, zero point eight nine, which is not significant, show that like um, degradation in the area is due to uh, rainfall impacts, and then. Um, on the right side, I showed a main candle trend, which shows. Um, rainfall trend and the NDVI trend. So just to show that like uh, rainfall in the area has um, significantly declined. And then uh, the NDVI um, residual trend is fairly constant. And this um, may be as a result of uh, variability of rainfall as um, on the uh, figures you can see like uh, in other years, there were like spikes of um, the residual trend, especially on the NDVI, like in uh, 1996, 2003, and 2007. Uh, so in the area, there's been like high period of um, where there's like high rainfall and other periods where there was like a significant um, decline in rainfall, which affected the vegetation. And then the spatial um, uh, residual trend, 
uh, this reveals um, degradation at a cell level or factors at, at, um, affecting degradation at a cell level. So for the overall district, um, 50%, it shows that 53% of the area is indeed degrading. And then from this 53%, uh, for 1%, for 1.41% is degrading due to impacts of um, rainfall or due to rainfall decline. And 11.59% um, shows that the area is degrading due to uh, human impacts. And these are areas indicated in your red colors. And then I will also explain uh, the reason for um, the green colors or improvement of vegetation um, productivity. But then this was because of a bush encroachment that was uh, observed in the area. So the, the, the NDVI showed as if like the vegetation is improving, but then bush encroachment is also um, one of the indicators of uh, land degradation. And then um, from the restaurant results and also the key informant uh, interviews that we did, uh, the, following, the following was uncovered. Firstly, rainfall was the main contributor and um, rainfall factors affecting land degradation in the area include a uh, rainfall variability and impacts of drought. Um, so this means that like after a long period of drought that reduced vegetation cover in the area, uh, uh, flash floods have uh, resulted in a uh, soil erosion, water erosion, and sedimentation in water resources. And there has also been um, severe droughts in the years 2002, 2004, 1992, and also uh, 2015. And then uh, the human-induced land degradation include um, settlement encroachment into productive uh, cropping land, uh, land tenor conflicts, um, excessive wood harvesting, overstocking, and overgrazing. All of these factors are uh, due to lack of um, rangeland management in the area. And also there was a uh, cropland abandonment and bush encroachment. So the, the factors I've mentioned about um, lack of uh, rangeland management, including cropland abandonment, have uh, encouraged bush encroachment in the area, of which this is um, another issue that still requires like more investigation. And this was um, the reason for the green uh, or the improved vegetation that was noticed on the maps that I showed previously. So in conclusion, um, a restaurant is an effective tool of analysis of correlation between climatic factors and uh, NDVI to reveal a productivity change in the area. But another, um, Revelation in the study is that like, there is a synergistic impact of uh, climate variability and extreme weather events that have intensively degraded the, um, the district. So efforts have been made to address land degradation. However, challenges to address this include like high speed, high speed of flash floods that removed uh, erosion structures that were erected in the area, uh, inappropriate measures to manage range lands and sedimentation in uh, water sources. So with the different trend um, is used, it will reveal a uh, cell level um, contributing vectors of uh, land degradation. And it will also um, assist in terms of identifying appropriate sustainable land management interventions to address land degradation from the source. And then from the key informants, it was highlighted that a, an integrated and coordinated approach is required. But then this uh, firstly needs like um, a sense uh, a need for a sense of agency from um, the government, the tribal authority as um, custodians of natural resources in the area, and also from the land users. I would like to thank um, the funders and uh, also uh, uh, the university that I'm doing my master's at, and also um, the Limpopo Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, and also the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Junit, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, please share your email address and details uh, in the chat box. We will get in touch. Thank you. We will now go ahead with the next presenter uh, for the day. Is she signing? Hello. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, please go Hello. Ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, give me a second. Let me share my screen.
So yeah, uh, hello, uh, hello everyone. I'm Hiteshi Seni, and I'm currently pursuing my BTech from Indira Gandhi Delhi Technical University. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present uh, my paper titled as Real-Time Recognition of Human Facial Expressive Behavior Using Deep Convent Model. Uh, Anisha, next slide, please. The objective of our paper is to enhance human computer interaction and developing a method that can detect facial expression in real time. Next. Yeah. As we all know, emotion plays an important part in determining someone's behavior and helps to distinguish their internal emotional states and their dilemmas. From research, it is known humans share seven basic different facial expression that is disgust, anger, fear, happiness, sadness, surprise, and neutral. Facial emotion detection research has focused on identifying human emotion based on picture or video records. A lot of researchers developed a, a facial emotion recognition model utilizing multiple neural networks, parallel computing, and ensemble learning by categorizing emotion from both language and visual angles. And several FER developers adopted these methods. Some res other researchers used auditory and facial expression and explored decision level integration and feature level integration as two methods and by combining these two modalities. Currently, works are developed and evaluated using images taken in a controlled experimental setting, a bias on a publicly available standard data sets. In lab photography, depicts participants holding a near frontal and a frontal head postures with photographs captured under controlled lighting conditions and image resolutions are typically high. Instead, in real time, none of these constraints are controlled. Human computer interaction tasks are short clips are frequently used to elicit expressive behaviors that drastically reduces the data complexity. Instead, none of these features are restricted and majority of real life applications cannot control the data collection settings. The data set used for the experiment is taken from the Kegel the data set was highly imbalanced, so undersampling was performed, and uh, the statistics of the data set after undersampling is shown in the figure. Next slide, please. In the figure, architecture of the proposed model is shown. The model uses two convolution layer with batch normalization in between. The input images is resized to 48 by 48 and is feeded to the first convolution layer. The pooling layer is given a feature map to minimize it without losing information to reduce overfitting. Dropout layer is used. The output of the convolution layer is processed by the ELU activation function as it eliminates the dying ReLU issue while simultaneously outperform leaky ReLU. He normal kernelization is used since it is compatible with ELU activation function. Next slide, please. After defining the model structure, model was trained for the 100 epochs and early stopping callback were called to avoid the problem of over 50. At 45th epoch and the best weights were restored. The figure shows the training and the validation curves of accuracy and losses of the model. After training, testing data was sent to the model for making predictions and evaluating our model's results. In figure eight, confusion matrix is shown. The heat map depicts the proportion of the test data that are accurately classified. In the table one, classification report is shown, broken down by the cla classes. It can be seen that the model shows great results for the happiness and surprise tag images.
For the real-time detection, an application is built using Python PYQT5 in a QT designer library that requires webcam access to capture sequence of frames. Harkaski classifier is used to detect the facial features in real time and was sent to the model for making predictions. In the figure, screenshot of the application is shown. So to conclude the presentation, the robotic industries will benefit greatly from this technology by giving them the access to the emotions and through processing it. Also enables the pe people with autism spectrum disorder to access computers. The network is defined and trained to be able to classify the appropriate emotions before being applied to real-time emotion identification. The model could be successful, successfully applied in a variety of a real world implementation in fields like health, video, games, and marketing industries. And here are some references. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Anishu Sirman Hitachi, for your wonderful presentation. So welcome everybody. Um, yes, uh, as it was uh, said, the title is Tribological and Mechanical Properties of the Selected Polymer Ceramic Pie Composites. Uh, my name is Agnieszka Tomal. I am representing Krakow University of Technology Faculty of Material Engineering and Physics. Uh, I am a part of the TeamNet project. Um, and together with my colleagues, uh, with Agmara Smota and Professor Agnieszka Subject-Kupis, who presented already the introduction uh, of this project. Uh, we are a part of the um, multi multifunctional biologically active composites for application in bone regenerative medicine. Uh, the general aim of the project is the development uh, of an innovative biomaterial, uh, which may feel the bond effects, uh, which imitate the shape and the size and release uh, the active biologica bi biologically active uh, substances that can support the proliferation and growth of the bone cells. Uh, so we are developing uh, two types of polymer ceramic matrices. One is a PFOPEC. It's a poly, poly, polyvinyl pyrrolidium and polyethylene glycol. It's a, it's a, it's a coatings on a polylactyl, polylactate plates. Uh, and the second type is a, a PVA and PVP. Uh, it's a poly, polyvinyl alcohol and polyvinyl pyrrolidone. It's a matrices, and bo both of these polymer ceramic um, composites are modified with compo with um, biologically active uh, hydroxyapatite um, and uh, and collagen and also with, uh, for example, uh, clindamycin, uh, as well as TGF. Uh, it's a, like a um, growth factors or VEGF. Um, so that's about the introduction. Um, so as I mentioned, we want to, um, we want to um, fix the bond effects with the um, biopolymer, uh, with the modified with hydroxyapatite. Uh, in a situation like this, uh, in the bond we have a very high, uh, um, small amplitude motion, uh, very high fretting, uh, very high fretting with a small amplitude motion uh, with a load uh, loads on it. That's why we want to simulate uh, such a condition. And uh, that's why we will investigate the um, tribological and mechanical properties of such a composite. Uh, the most important factor is uh, actually the, the geometry and the topography of the surface because the, the apparent contact area is, um, is not equal to real contact area. That's why the topography of the surface is very important in order to reveal what is the real contact area of the, of the surfaces. Um, here is the, uh, the development of the composition. So as I mentioned, uh, we have two uh, types of um, uh, 
polymer ceramic composites. So one is uh, matrices, uh, which are bigger samples that uh, look like this. And uh, they are composed of polyvinyl pyrrolidium and polyvinyl alcohol. They uh, has 30% uh, of collagen and uh, maximum 10% of uh, hydroxyapatite uh, also. It is important to mention that the cross-linking agent here uh, is called uh, PECTA. It's the polyethylene glycol uh, diacrylate. It uh, has a molar mass of 700 gram per mole. Uh, it's higher in the matrices compared to the coatings where the uh, molar um, mass is uh, lower of this uh, cross-linking agent. And in the coatings, we have a different type of uh, polymer. It's a PVLP PEG. Uh, <coughs> so poly, uh, vinyl, uh, polyvinyl pyrrolidium and polyethylene glycon. Uh, glutathione is to fix the bonding, uh, to improve the bonding with the PLL plates. As you can see here are the coatings. And so here we have only 2% of collagen and hydroxic appetite is modified um, 5, 15% in the sample number three and four. Uh, here we have the um, surface uh, morphology of the matrices, a PVLP, PVLL. It's uh, show the uh, same edX uh, image of the first uh, pure uh, polymer without no additives. And in a, here in the second image, we can see the um, polymer modified with uh, hydroxyapatite. Uh, in an optical microscope, we can see uh, how, the uh, how the morphology of the surface uh, changes when we introduce here hydroxyapatite and here collagen. Um, also, it can be shown on this uh, profilometry scans how the topography of the surface is uh, changing. Um, uh, here we have a um, um, roughness profile, uh, and we can see that in case when we have a pure polymer, uh, the, the samples are very smooth. Uh, and in case when we in introduce hydroxyapatite and when we modify the surface with collagen, the roughness of the surface, the parameters of the roughness are increasing a lot. Uh, more than uh, even 10 times, eight or uh, 10 times, uh, depending which parameter. Uh, we also have measured the, um, the contact um, angle in order to reveal the hydro, um, hydro, hydro facility and hydrophobility of the surfaces. Uh, we also have uh, measured the free surface energy. Uh, these parameters are very important factors that because they affect the cytocompatibility of biomaterials. And um, it, it was shown that uh, the cells pr uh, prefer to attach on the surfaces of moderate hydro uh, hydrophilicity uh, than on very hydrophobic uh, or very hydrophobic surfaces. That's why we want to always to have the contact angle below 90 degrees. That uh, means that the uh, surface has a moderate, uh, this biomaterial has a, like a moderate um, hydrophilicity. Uh, and in case of uh, matrices, PVP, PVI, we are always below 90 degrees and the total uh, free um, surface energy is the highest for the pure polymer uh, matrix without any additives. Uh, now I tell you more about the surface mor morphology of the coatings of the PVP pack. Here we have a pure, uh, pure polymer, sample A, uh, sample B is uh, modified with collagen. Uh, sample C is uh, modified with uh, collagen and 5% of uh, hydroxyapatite. And the most uh, rough surface is the one that contains 15% of the hydroxyapatite. And it can also be shown on this roughness profile that the um, that the micro geometry is changing. Uh, here, the, as we can see, the, the, the surface is smooth. In a case when we have pure polymer, para, um, polymer uh, coatings, when in case when we add the hydroxyapatite and collagen, the uh, roughness increases. 
Yes, uh, and it's the highest for the sample which contain 50% of hydroxyapatite. Uh, another parameters for the coatings is this contact angle. Here we are always, uh, also always below 90 degrees that the biomaterials has the good uh, properties. So they are hydrophilic because the, the contact angles are below 90 degrees. And this is what we expect for biomaterials to have. So, now we switch to the tribological test. Uh, here we have use, uh, used nano tribometer in order to simulate this high uh, reciprocating motion. Um, and the load is, uh, is moderate. It's uh, approximately 500 millinewtons. And uh, we use a ball uh, against the, our uh, plates or our uh, polymer ceramic composite. So here below, you can see how the um, coefficient of friction versus time, it's the, the one factor that we measure. And the second factor that we measure in tribological uh, measurements is the wear of uh, our bio biomaterial. And we can calculate the volume of wear, and also we can calculate the depth and the width of such a wear scar. Uh, yes, and here we have uh, tribological test results for the uh, PEFOPEPEC uh, coatings. Uh, as you can see, the highest coefficient of friction is for the first sample, which is a reference sample of which doesn't contain any additive, so it's a pure polymer, uh, PEFOPEPEC. Uh, so the coefficient of friction is, is high here, and also the wear volume is very high. So uh, it's not the best composition. However, the situation uh, improves in uh, when we add a collagen and hydroxyapatite. When we add um, five percent of hydroxyapatite or only collagen, we have the lowest coefficient of friction and the lowest um, wear volume. Uh, in case uh, uh, here we have a um, like a wear mechanism showing a wear mechanism for the before pack, and uh, here we can see that um, we have a very smooth uh, wear track, uh, but very high wear volume for the pure polymer uh, matrix. And when we add a uh, hydroxyapatite and collagen, we have the much lower wear volume. Um, especially for the sample that con contains 5% of uh, hydroxyapatite and collagen. Uh, in, uh, in case when we have a lot of uh, hydroxyapatite, we have a very big wear track, a very um, rough surface because the particles of hydroxyapatite in um, like um, um, uh, improve the wear. Uh, in case uh, of uh, tribological properties of the matrices, here uh, is a similar situation that coefficient of friction is highest for a pure polymer polymer uh, um, matrix. And uh, it's much better when we have a collagen and uh, when we have a small amount of uh, hydroxyapatite. So the red curve in the uh, coefficient of friction uh, is the lowest coefficient of friction and the lowest wear. So this is the best composition uh, in case of matrices, the one that contains 10% uh, of hydroxyapatite and 30% of collagen. Uh, and here is uh, we have the wear mechanism, and we see again that the smoothest surface and the smooth, uh, the lowest uh, wear volume is for the last sample. Uh, here we also measure tensile uh, strength test, uh, and the Young modulus for in case of the coatings is the highest for the composition where we have the. Um, um, for the composition where we have hydroxyapatite and collagen. And in case of matrices, we have um, highest tensile stress also for the uh, samples that contains hydroxyapatite and collagen. And in order to conclude, uh, we have implementation of the collagen in the diverse composite matrix can, can tailor demanding tribological performance, like anti-wear and friction reduction, the addition of the ceramic 
per face uh, in too high contents, be like 15%, was too much because it led to the very strong surface roughening and loosening topological properties. Uh, and uh, in this case, small particles of hydroxyapatite uh, were crumbling, having a strong abrasive effect on the sample surface. Uh, matrices prepared using the cross-linking agent with higher average molecular weight. Uh, 700 uh, gram per mole showed higher tensile strength and mechanical and anti-wear performance. Um, and in conclusion, we can say that uh, PVP PEG and PVP PVA modified with collagen and small amount of hydroxy uh, apatite of the ceramic phase. At, uh, only these samples at, at exhibit, exhibit high biologically um, or high bioactivity and strong mechanical and tribological properties. Uh, they also show high free surface energy, porosity, and accepted roughness to be implemented as a material for bone regeneration medicine. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you for your wonderful research on tribological. Hello, everyone. My name is Karina Piantak, and uh, I'm a PhD student in Krakow University of Technology. Um, I would like to give a presentation on the topic functional composite biomaterials with polysaccharide for regenerative medicine application. Um, biomaterials are an innovative solution in regenerative medicine. Uh, depending on the application, different groups of biomaterials are chosen and can be polymeric, metallic, ceramic, and also composite biomaterials. Um, the latter branch uh, is developing quite rapidly to the demand for such materials in orthopedics as well as in dentistry. Um, biomaterials uh, obtained in this way have the potential to be modified with various active substances, including drugs, polysaccharides, proteins, or various plant extracts. Uh, many plant extracts are characterized by, the, by a high content of terpenes, polyphenols and flavonoids, um, which show potential anti-cancer, anti-diabetic um, and anti-inflammatory activities. Uh, the aim of this study was to obtain a composite biomaterials um, with a polymer matrix uh, with a ceramic face as carrier for, uh, for the active substances by photo cross-linking and uh, under the uh, ultraviolet lamp. Additionally, um, the biomaterials was modified by the addition of polysaccharides and flavonoids. Uh, the samples were subjected to incubation tests in fluid simulated, uh, simulating the, uh, the internal environment of the organism. Uh, in addition, uh, the release kinetics of the active substances were studied. Um, during the 14-day incubation in simulated body fluid, uh, changes occurred on the surface of the test materials. Um, now we uh, formed apatite layers can be seen. Uh, based on the uh, figure number three, the resulting ceramic phase biomaterials are characterized by a lower swelling uh, factor compared to, uh, to polymeric materials. Um, the release profile indicates a gradual uh, release of polyphenols from the obtained ceramic polymer biomaterials. Um, the amount of released active substances depends um, on the swelling rate ratio. Um, based on the results obtained, uh, it can be concluded that the uh, presence of the ceramic phase in the composites uh, influences the amount of active substances released. Um, I would like to express my thanks to the project. Um, multifunctional biolo biologically active substances composites for application in bone regenerative medicine, which is, um, which is being carried out under the TeamNet program of the Foundation for Polish Science, founded by the European Union under the European Regional Development Fund. And thank you for your attention. Good morning.
morning, everyone. My name is Violeta Forkiewicz, and today I want to show you some short presentation about my team list latest research. And in our research, we are working on ceramic polymer composites that can be used as an active substance carrier. And the purpose of uh, research was evaluation of ceramic polymer composite materials intended for regenerative medicine application that can be applied as carriers, as carriers for active substances, including uh, antibiotics. As a constituent of our materials, we use Fulan, uh, PVP, photoinitiator to hydroxy to metal propiofenone, and crosslinking agents. Uh, materials were crosslinked under UV light. As a ceramic phase, we use uh, hydroxyapatite, uh, which is well-known uh, bioactive ceramic material. Uh, hydroxyapatite was prepared by wet precipitation method based on reaction between calcium nitrate tetrahydrate and ammonium dihydrogen phosphate uh, in strongly alkaline solution provided by, by ammonia, ammonia water. And such obtained hydroxyapatite was used as a component of ceramic polymer materials. Uh, in our studies, uh, we check the swelling ability of the obtained composite materials in uh, phosphate buffer saline. Uh, variation of the composition and structure of materials may cause a difference in the rate at which water or other liquid medium is absorbed into the, into the structure of the prepared material, by, but also may affect uh, the kinetics of releasing of active components from their structure. Uh, in our study, PBS, phosphate buffer saline, was used as an immersion solution mimicking the environment of the human body for the sake of investigation of the effect of materials composition on swelling kinetics. Uh, a dried sample of composite materials were immersed in PBEs for a specific period of, of time, and next the swelling composite was weighted at ambient temperature at the analytical weight. As, as can be seen, uh, from the figures, all materials achieve a high degree of swelling um, during the initial phase, phase of the experiment and then begins to level off. And moreover, the rate of fluid absorption was uh, progressively re reduced to reach uh, an equilibrium about, after about 20 hours of immersion and the tested materials were, were also demonstrated to have different swelling capacity between 130% uh, to 250% depending on the composition of the materials. And our research show, showed that sample containing, containing uh, purulan are characterized with uh, greater absorption capacity. And on the, on the other hand, on the other hand uh, rate parameters are greater for, greater for samples containing ceramic, ceramic uh, which indicates that Hydroxyapatite addition may, use, may cause uh, loosening of the polymeric structure and uh, faster liquid absorption in the material structure. Uh, in this research, we also perform surface uh, roughness uh, analysis, mainly because the initial response of the uh, tissue environment to the, bi to the biological materials uh, is strongly dependent on a composition microstructure and detail profile of the surface of biomedical materials, which may which may um, stimulate process at the cellular cellular level and promote the functional activity of cells. Result, results shows that the addition of hydroxyapatite leads to significant changes in roughness parameters. The term, the determinant profile. Profile height as well as average roughness of surface appears to increase due to the application of hydroxyapatite as the component uh, of the materials. And based on our studies, we conclude that swelling ability studies show that show that uh, um, the adding of pool land increased material sorption capacity. But on the other hand, the ceramic phase, which was hydroxyapatite, gives us a reinform reinforcement in Composites leads to the decrease, decreased uh, swelling ability of materials. And ceramic polymers, polymer composites can be a prospective innovative solution for regenerative, regenerative medicine, supporting tissue regeneration and also act as a drug delivery system with, with control active substance use. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, ma'am. My name is Pralay Shankar Maitra. I'll be uh, uh, talking about groundwater variability along with the Bering coastline of Tiruvananthavaram district. So Tiruvananthavaram district is a small district uh, around Kerala, which is a part of southwestern India. So shoreline change is a constantly evolving phenomenon that threatens people and their livelihoods around the globe. India has a coastline of about 6,635 kilometers. And 32% of the coastline has undergone erosion, majority of which occurred between 1990 and 2018. So our research is basically mostly uh, between uh, 2000 uh, to 2022. So these are this is the statistics that we have gone through before actually conducting the study. Uh, West Bengal has shown the highest amount of uh, uh, erosion uh, as compared to accretion. With that, uh, so our study is on Kerala mostly, and uh, we have focused on the western coast of uh, India. So Kerala lies on the southwestern part of India, and uh, we have done the study on Tiruvananthapuram district, which is the southernmost district of Kerala. This is our study area, basically. Uh, <clears throat> so Tiruvananthapuram district, as I said, is a small part of Kerala, which uh, accounts for around 70 kilometers of coastline of Kerala. And uh, uh, our problem definition is like one of the ma main major hazards which accompanies any coastline is erosion. In order to study the extent of shoreline change and its effects on effects, we choose a study region as the southernmost uh, coast of Kerala state, which is on the western coast of India, as studies on the western coast, actually towards the southern part of the country, was limited. Groundwater levels and conductivity correlation with shoreline change rate. And decut in prediction on two sites with one with one one with high rates of erosion that is Shangumugam Beach and one with high rates of accretion that is Prison Jam International Seaport. So we'll all see the spots where we have mentioned these names. Uh, one is uh, one is the uh, one which has shown high rates of erosion and one which has shown high rates of accretion. Objectives: Our study area was the coastline of Tiruvannamalai district. Getting second objective: getting transects and subsequently statistical measures like linear regression rates and linear regression uh, via digital shoreline analysis system tool on ArcGIS desktop, calculating the coastal vulnerability index using DSAS tool. This, this is our literature review. So data collection, uh, we have collected, uh, there are six parameters which are needed in uh, CVI calculation. Uh, those are slope, uh, geomorphology, mean sea level rise, mean tidal range, mean wave height. Uh, so DM we have collected from SRT in global 30 meters. Shoreline extraction was done from Sentinel 2A and Landsnet 7 and 8 from USGS Earth Explorer. Geomorphology was they got gotten from Brukosh. Mean sea level rise from IPCC. Mean tidal range from WX type software. Mean wave height from past papers. Groundwater data from India RIS. And softwares used were ArcGIS Desktop, DSAS, NV, ArcGIS Pro, WX type Python, Excel, etc. etc. So we have taken uh, from 2002 to 2022, uh, Landsat 7 data was available for 2002 to 2006, 2010, and Landsat 8 was for 2014, Sentinel 2A was for 2018 and 22. So using NV, we had to uh, fix scanline errors in Landsat 7. And uh, in Sentinel 2, uh, since it was not covering the whole study areas, so we were able to mosaic uh, the two images into one. And we did ISO cluster so unsupervised classification for uh, classifying in between land and sea. And these are the basic steps to actually calculate uh, the, to merge all the shorelines, to extract the shorelines of all the different days, of, of all the all different years, and uh, find the shoreline change rate. So these are the various sources of information that we have received from the internet, uh, geomorphology from Bukosh, uh, slope from SRT and DM, mean sea level rise from uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change, LRR from shoreline, uh, LRR was calculated from the shoreline, mean wave height uh, as we take took as 1.1 meters from past papers uh, from the literature review part. And tidal range was taken as 0.45 to 0.65 meters. These values were taken by average in the tidal height between 10 to 12 a.m. for each date, uh, Landsat or Sentinel image correspondingly. So we have used the formula Gornet CVI index, which is a uh, geometric mean of all the six parameters. Uh, and uh, we have used this to calculate the final CVI. So this uh, from, we have classified actually, uh, 
we have classified uh, each parameter into three uh, risk factors according to Gornet's model. And we have finally got the CBA from the above, from the prior slide information that was mainly the geometric mean of all the six parameters. So basically, C wave height and tidal range was uh, and mean sea level rise was constant for the whole slope because it's a, uh, it is a very small study area. So the these three things were mainly constant. LRR we got from uh, DSAS tool. DSAS is a uh, uh, Data, digital shoulder analysis system tool, which is uh, which we can get an ArcGIS map to actually calculate uh, shoulder line changes in and around the globe. And the uh, slope we got from uh, DEM, uh, 30 MBM, geomorphology we got from Hoop of India. So this was the final coastal vulnerability index map. Uh, so we have actually uh, got several uh, places where we can see uh, erosion and as well as accretion. Uh, shoreline change rate was mainly seen, uh, erosion was mainly seen, seen at Shangumugam beach and Pozikara beach for Paruthiur and accretion in the sense land land formation around the coast was seen at Vizanjam International Seaport. So as you can see, this video shows a time lapse of the Shangumugam beach and how it's getting eroded so fast between the years 2000, 2000 and 2022. Moving on. So uh, as you can see, Shangamugam beach shows high rates of erosion and mainly the, the place was used to be a hub of uh, people because uh, the people used to come from many parts of India to visit this place uh, because of its scenic beauty and all. But now it's totally destroyed. Vizinjam International Seaport on the other hand, on the other side is like uh, building and building uh, artificial land masses to, uh, to accommodate uh, uh, import and export by ships. So we also did a decadical, decadical prediction using Kalman filter model is using the same DSAS tool that we were talking about. And uh, 2000 in Shangamugam beach, uh, the shoreline change rate, the shoreline will go further inside down, further inside. And in uh, Vizingram International Seaport, the shoreline will come outside. Uh, like it is uh, this filter, Kalman filter model works on data given to it. So since uh, we had given uh, certain data, like how the shoreline is, uh, like how the shoreline we extracted from the different Landsat images. So finally, we get this cuddle prediction. So this is basically an example of ISO cluster classification where we have classified the uh, Landsat image on the left hand side. Because you can see it's a false, it's a color infrared image. And we have classified into and we have classified into land and sea basically only two giving two clusters. And uh, finally, we will analyze this data with our groundwater data. So groundwater, we have seen that uh, the shoreline erosion rate is uh, when it's increasing, the groundwater depth change rate is also increasing. Meaning as the groundwater table becomes part of the main sea due to erosion, there is a loss in the freshwater groundwater table. Also, uh, due to the change in uh, uh, shoreline erosion change, rate, electrical conductivity also increases, which also gives an indication that when uh, the, uh, there is erosion, the groundwater table loses some of its attributes to the main sea and uh, the uh, solute particles intrude in, which is a major topic of discussion which we can't discuss here, and which leads to the increase in electrical conductivity or the stability of the groundwater table. Conclusion the shoreline line change it shows most of the region undergoing erosion, only few accretions or landform were observed. High rates of erosion were present in Alapura, Tirumanthapuram, and Kollam districts of the states. Accretion mainly along the Vizinjam intercoastal, Vizinjam coast due to artificial land mass formation. The groundwater table decreases with erosion as the main sea which is salty includes them and the groundwater becomes part of the sea. Hence, there is a fall in the groundwater table which is mainly fresh water. Thank you. That's all. Thank you for your very nice research work. Uh, we'll, please do share your email address in the chat box and your affiliation will be in touch. Thank you. Very nice research work also. Thank you. I'm a lecturer at the Deben University of Technology in Deben, South Africa. My email address is also on the screen. Um, well, the, the title of uh, my study is uh, Gender Differences in Entrepreneurial Orientation in the Product Innovation of Manufacturing Small and, and Medium Enterprises. Okay. Um, how should I 
Yes. yes. Well, um, in terms of introduction and background of the study, um, South Africa is one of the biggest uh, economy, I mean, one of the biggest economies of African continent, as you know, but, but, but the country faces high unemployment and inequality, where women have limited access to economic mainstream. So despite some progress in, 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 in including underrepresented women, small business sector has not reached parity between men and women. Several barriers, including the discriminatory cultural practices, limited mobility, voice, and, 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 and representation, a disproportionate uh, share of family and, and household responsibility, and, and the lack of maternity protection uh, are among the factors that, that seem to limit women from, from exhibiting their full entrepreneurial potential. So the problem under investigation is simply that the South African I mean, innovation policy success lies on how it incorporates both the economic and social environment of innovation. For instance, the country faces the challenge in creating sustainable uh, employment opportunities in manufacturing uh, industry. Uh, but, but, but having said that, a positive trend shows that female business uh, uh, ownership rates have risen in recent decades. But, but, but the prevalence of, of business ownership among men, I mean women, in, um, I mean, it, it is only 50 to 60 of, 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 of that uh, for, for men. So the aggregate data from, from the Organization for, for Economic Cooperation and Development shows that a low rate of, of, of business ownership among women it is a worldwide phenomenon. It, 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 it is then not clear whether there are gender differences in, 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 in entrepreneurial orientation of, of owner managers of SMMEs or, or small and medium enterprises to innovate in their product offering. So the purpose of this study is, is to determine whether there are gender differences in entrepreneurial orientation in the product innovation of uh, manufacturing small and medium sized enterprises. This paper is important because it addresses the inclusiveness of women who are regarded as, as marginalized group in social and economic uh, benefit of, of the country, especially in the context of, of South Africa and Africa. So the literature is not conclusive in terms of how they, uh, I mean, uh, uh, identify the differences between men and women. We said uh, that uh, entrepreneurial orientation, first of all, I mean, studies initially regarded innovativeness as a, as a central characteristic of an entrepreneur orientation. Uh, and studies on gender differences in innovation, innovativeness revealed that when compared to their male counterparts, female entrepreneurs are less innovative and thus less inclined to expansion and, and innovation. But also uh, other studies found that uh, male or I mean owner managers were likely to introduce product innovations than their female uh, I mean owner managers counterparts. In contrast, um, Ted, uh, Ten established that women uh, entrepreneurs are more pro I mean, proactive than men as, as they are more willing to take bold, bolder decision to, to move into risk, risk and, and, and untried ventures when compared to their female counterparts. In, in, in this context, this study hypothesis that there is a statistical significant uh, difference between the, the mean uh, values, gender, and innovativeness, risk-taking, and proactiveness. And this is, as you can see, the study model. And we try to look at uh, the gender differences in terms of the, the, the three important dimensions of, of, of entrepreneurial orientation, that is innovativeness, risk-taking, proactiveness, and how that then, then I mean, uh, leads to, to product innovation uh, of, of small and medium enterprises. The method or research method used here, obviously, we, this is a quantitative study and cross-sectional survey design was selected from, from the database of Deben Chamber of Commerce and, 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 
industry in South Africa, a sample was drawn and 300 SNNAs were selected for a purpose of, of, of achieving the objectives of this study. So this is a judgmental sample, um, as, as it is important to indicate that it is not easy to have a complete um, you know, population of SNNAs as they are being created on daily basis. So a structured questionnaires was distributed to owner managers uh, of, of, of uh, small and medium enterprises. And, and it is also important to indicate that the three important dimensions that were developed by, uh, by, by, by Miller are still validated by so many researchers. So those are the same dimensions that we use under this study. All data coll I mean, collection activities were monitored to ensure adherence to, to data collection protocol. Statistical a package for, for social uh, um, sciences, SPSS, was used to analyze that. And this was the result of the, uh, the table result of the, the ANOVA test that, were con well, that was conducted. And, and based on the result, um, we can say that the literature provided contradictory uh, study, I mean, result with regards to gender and entrepreneur orientation. But based on the result, based on the statistic mean and, and ANOVA that were conducted under the study, the study confirms that there is no difference between men and women uh, as, as both express uh, the, the same opinion on the variables innovativeness, risk-taking and proactiveness for product innovation of small and medium enterprises. So the study reiterates that gender cannot reflect the attitude of owner I mean, on managers of, of small and medium sized enterprises um, uh, toward innovation uh, and, and risk, as well as proactive decisions to compete in the market. Results show that, uh, that uh, there is no difference between men and, and, and women in the innovativeness, risk taking, and proactiveness in the product innovation of SMMAs. So, gender has no influence on the way the owner managers approach innovation, uh, decide to take risk and anticipate the market. This study recommend policy interventions to create full opportunities for women participation and involvement in the economic mainstream. It further recommends the support for women entrepreneur, initi entrepreneur initiatives in their, in, in their attempt rather to, to, to contribute to the employment creation. There, is, there, there are also limitations that I have to indicate that this study is, that has been done in the context of, of South Africa, which is still a, a developing economy. Uh, and we may have different results within, uh, I mean, uh, other contexts, especially for, for developed countries. Uh, and also we need to indicate the other limitation is that uh, we focused on, on, on small and medium uh, sized enterprises that uh, large uh, organization may provide different, different results. Thank you so much for your attention. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you, sir. Very nice topic which you have taken on your research work. Uh, we'll be in touch. Uh, thank you. My stuff is uh, from this side, and today I'm going to present on predicting Bitcoin price with a time series analysis. So, Bitcoin basics are one of the customers Bitcoin is the cryptocurrency which started uh, the flooding of the civil uh, of cryptocurrency. It is based, cryptocurrency works on a, a platform which is called on the blockchain, which uh, is a chain of blocks containing transaction data. So, any currency is used for transactions, and as these uh, transactions happen uh, using the Bitcoin blockchain, reports to this uh, uh, transaction. Why the cryptocurrency? Because no government technology is providing any uh, traditional currency. It only exists in the virtual world, the online world. How it works is uh, based on something called the distributed ledger, which maintains and regulates uh, the cryptocurrency and property 
Yes, uh, in technical issues, we'll wait for a minute so that uh, he will continue. Any other presentations left? If not, we'll wait for a minute so that. Uh, Thank you. Is there any Shabba? Can you share? Uh... Shabba is. Uh, can you unmute and check? The presentation is visible. You can share the presentation in the chat box or else. Hello. Please go ahead and complete of the presentation. Okay, uh, so we're talking about the Bitcoin, the, the crypto blockchain platform, and it has a distributed like it. Bitcoin is uh, traded uh, with uh, US dollars, and so uh, Bitcoin price against the US dollars can uh, be modeled. So our work is based on the future of Bitcoin price against the US dollars within the analysis. The blockchain technology is basically has got a three major pillars or three major characteristics. It has got a consensus mechanism, which is dependent upon the proof of work, which involves solving a really difficult mathematical problem. And if you solve it in a, a time frame, the majority of the nodes exit on the state of uh, the blockchain, uh, then uh, everybody can, uh, and the uh, blockchain can be finalized. So there are basically two types of the blockchains which in, uh, exist. They are public, uh, the permissionless uh, blockchains, which anybody can uh, access. Or the private ones, which are called a permission, where access to the blockchain is controlled uh, uh, by some central authority. Also, we have got something called as a smart contracts, which are uh, the small snippets of code or uh, the contracts which can exist automatically without any human interventions. When we come uh, to the time series analysis, uh, time series is any recorded observations of any single entity over a period of time. For doing time series analysis, it is required that the time series analysis, time series has to be very uh, stationary. What we can uh, test this uh, time series using the Philips Monstein test, what is normally called as the PSS test. Another uh, Test which is available to check the uh, time series uh, security is called as test. If a series is found not stationary, you can initiate it and make it a uh, test. What we are using is a time series analysis. The station is called the RIMA model. This RIMA model is an amalgamation of the model. Thank you for your wonderful presentation.